no so we've started recording um plan is to upload this to uh, youtube and our website after just for anyone that can't join or if you miss some of it um so yeah hopefully that's all right with everybody but just to let you know and then yeah if you do want to watch any of it back then uh you've got the opportunity there so we'll send around um the link to the recording and also if good with you can we'll send around the slides after as well um but yeah so i'm i'm hannah a sustainability program manager for lancaster west and neighborhood team and this is the latest of our sustainability series so we've been running these series as part of our uh, green skills academy to help kind of boost understanding and awareness of different issues to do with um, sustainability uh, for colleagues across council, other uh, organisations that we're working with and also residents. Um, I think this one is a, a particularly important one. So we're talking about PAS 2035 today, um, which I won't <laughs> give too much detail about, uh, spoil it all for Ken, but it's basically a framework for um, how you can deliver quality retrofit and is something which is a criteria of a lot of the grant funding that we're using as a council to deliver uh, energy efficiency works across our stock. So um, as I was just saying to Ken, I think the more kind of conversations we can have oh, about this, the I better. To it's it's something no, we're all going to need to have some sort of knowledge about. And I'm sure lots of people, um, lots of people in this meeting will probably be involved to some extent in delivering various bits of grant funding or various bits of like retrofit work <laughs> so hopefully should be really relevant um but yeah so we should have about half an hour of Ken presenting and then hopefully lots of time for questions um at the end so if you do have any questions feel free to put them in the chat like throughout when Ken's speaking and we'll come back to them um so you don't forget but equally happy for everyone at the end if you want to just come on uh, camera and come on mic and ask any questions and that'll be fine. Um, yeah, we've got an hour in the diary. We'll see how long we take, but I'm sure if there are any kind of follow ups after, then we'll be able to sort that. Um, but yeah, on that, I'll pass over to Ken. Oh, hi, folks. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name's Ken Negus, as Hannah um, just introduced me nicely. Thank you very much, Hannah. Um, I have been um, a DEA non-domestic energy assessor, domestic energy assessor for the past 15 years and I have evolved into um, teaching and um, mentoring for the Retrofit Academy. I was a, uh, used to be a Retrofit uh, coordinator for Nottingham City Council. A few things I will share from that experience. Um, uh, this afternoon, I, it's not really, I'm not really going to talk you through past 2035 per se. What I'm going to try and do is to help you use past 2035 to make, to get your bids through and also to make it worthwhile and to understand some of the risks and issues that you might come up against uh, when you're looking for bids or working with bids and the bidding people. So, as I say, my name is Ken Negus. Uh, the agenda, I'm just going to quickly uh, explain what PAST 2035 is. Uh, roles, responsibilities and qualifications of PAST 2035. Um, a, a brief chat about the process. Um, explain how we work out the risk path for different projects. Talk about the Improvement Option Evaluation or IOE, as quite a lot of you will know. Uh, medium term improvement plan, moving on from the IOE. Um, a, a chat about monitoring and evaluation and any questions following that. OK. So. Uh, what is PAST 2035? Well, PAST 2035 is the overarching document in the retrofit standards framework. It was introduced following the recommendations of the Each Home Counts review. Uh, it followed on from quite a few uh, so-called retro so retrofit projects that had been carried out 
and quite honestly failed in the most awful way. People had homes where they never had any issues with condensation or or damp and ended up with really damp homes and people had to move out while the project was put was corrected. So past 2035, it details how to carry out quality energy retrofits of existing domestic buildings alongside best practice guidance for implementing energy efficiency measures. And all projects funded by the Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund, energy com company obligation, local authority delivery schemes or home upgrade grants will be required to comply with the standard. Now, my first point here would be that if you are in the process of writing bids for funding, I would suggest that you get your program in place first. Get all the staff you might need. Get your uh, timetable correct. Understand what you're going to do before you make that bid. Because when I was working with Nottingham City Council, we found ourselves in the position that we got, we were accepted with the bid, and then suddenly there was no program. Somebody had not thought to put things in place. It took a month to put people in place. It took a month to get the agenda straight. And that caused a real problem towards the end of the project because what Bayes or what used to be Bayes do when they issue funding or offer funding, they put a time limit on it. And if your program isn't correct or hasn't been properly organised, you are likely to run out of time. <clears throat> and the result of that was in Nottingham, we started to run out of time and the coordinators were asked to sign off projects that they weren't happy with just to get the funding. And I, for one, refused. That meant somebody else had to sign off the project and risk it going wrong, which in it inevitably would because of some of the, the faults with it. So, like I say, anybody writing bids or in the process of writing bids, make sure that you can fit the time frame with that bid. So roles and qualifications and accreditations in retrofit. Um, I hope you can all share my see my screen. And so I think Hazel's sharing the okay. screen at the moment. So if you want to just share. tell her. Yes, yeah, I will I share if you don't you mind. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, of course. Sorry, I could see it on my screen and I, <laughs> yes, I assumed I'd tell which Sorry. Switch. <laughs> Sorry. OK, can you see that now? Yep. Yeah, yeah. OK, brilliant. So roles, uh, qualifications and accreditations. So on the left, you will see the roles of the of, um, past 2035 recommendation. So at the top, you've got the retrofit advisor. Then we've got our retrofit assessor, coordinator, designer, installer and evaluator. Now, the retrofit advisor um, can deliver retrofit advice to clients and householders. What I would suggest with this role is that if you are going to employ people in this role, you, you get the best out of them. So you let them work alongside the assessors and the coordinators so that they can learn parts of their job. And then as the project grows and the coordinator gets busier on other projects and the assessor is off doing other work, if you need anybody to go to site on a regular basis, you can ask the retrofit advisor to take up that role, providing you give them good guidance on what they need to do. My take on this would be that if you sent somebody, uh, a retrofit advisor to site to, to monitor progress, then the best thing to do would be ask them to take photographs of everything that's currently being done. Um, it's OK, I'm trying to see some of you. That's better. I'm more comfortable with that. So yes, so get them to take photographs of everything that's being done so that they can feed that information back to the current coordinator. Um, and work with the coordinator to help them get through. Because once coordinators normally are given five or six projects to do, maybe even more, and it's very difficult to visit all of the sites when you really need to. So my advice would be to use that person in that retrofit advisor role 
to do that for you and to feed back the information. So the retrofit assessor, another recommendation from me would be to make sure you get the right people in place. I know for, from experience, I'm currently uh, doing some um, mentoring for the Retrofit Academy. And we are getting a lot of people doing the Retrofit Assessor course. And quite honestly, whilst they are passing the course because they're answering the right questions, some of the quality there isn't quite what it should be. Um, it's no reflection on the Academy because they are governed by the, the questions that are put in place. And if somebody answers the questions correctly, then clearly they're going to pass pass the test. But I would advise you to make sure that you've got good assessors in place and they know exactly what they're doing, because the project per se starts with the assessor. They go out, they gather all the relevant information, they produce a report for you. They have to speak to the client to ascertain what, how they use their home, because if their information is incorrect, then your project going forward is not going to be correct. And what you don't want to be doing is asking the coordinator to follow up on the assessor's work and check whether they've done it correctly. So you need to employ good people in these roles, even if you get them on board and train them yourself, quite honestly. My advice would be to, if you've got retrofit advisors in place or people doing that role, then I would I would say get those to go forward because the people that we've had come through from the generation scheme <clears throat> have been really good. They're really well trained and they're good advisors. But I've met people who've passed the retrofit advisor course on for other, um, in other ways that haven't been very good, I'm afraid. And you have to be really, really careful. The retrofit coordinator role, that's a very important role. I believe we've got some retrofit coordinators on the call. Um, I was led to understand there would be some on the call. Um, uh, once again, I assess retrofit coordinator portfolios and I've um, I listened to their test cases at the end of the, of the call. Most of these people are very good and very qualified. You have to be very careful when you're signing off on uh, on qualifications as, as um, good as a retrofit coordinator, because if you send the wrong people out there, then we're just going to end up back where we started and past 2035 isn't going to be worth the paper it's written on. Retrofit designers, I have nothing to do with design at all. Um, I, I'm not involved in that, but they're professional memberships. It can be on a risk path A, risk pass I will be explaining in a little while but if it's a risk path A then the uh, level five retrofit coordinator can do the design if it moves to path B and path C then it has to be a qualified retrofit designer or someone from the Chartered Institute of Builders Chartered Institute of Architectural Technologists Architects Registered in Building Conservation Royal Institute of British Architects Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors or the Royal Incorporation of Architects in Scotland. Any of those people are already qualified to be a retrofit designer. Retrofit installers, um, they come under the, the um, auspices of past 2030. So uh, any retrofit installer or any retrofit supplier to your project must be past 2030 certified. Uh, again, in the pro some of the projects uh, that I was involved in in Nottingham, <clears throat> we got to the stage where we had um, secured uh, a past 2030 uh, roof installer or um, roofer, but they employed people to come and do the um, loft insulation who weren't past 2030 qualified. That meant that when it came to the end and signing off the project, they didn't get their funding for the uh, locked insulation. Uh, the retrofit evaluator, uh, that can be a retrofit coordinator, that comes during monitoring and evaluation, which I will speak about in a little while. So 
So past 2035 process, there are seven steps. Step one is the inception of the project. Uh, so that's building up the project. Step two is to assess the risk path that that project will follow. Step three is to do the dwelling assessment. As I say, this is down to your retrofit assessor. Um, they already need to be a qualified DEA, so it's quite possible that you will ask them to do an EPC as well as doing the retrofit assessment, which would make real sense. I think relying on somebody else's EPC certificate, if it's not one of your employees, can be very dangerous. So I would, quite honestly, if I were you, I would recommend that if you are selling a, uh, sending out a retrofit assessor, you would ask them to do the EPC at the same time. That way, all your information comes in together and it can all be clarified by one person. Trust me, I've seen a lot of EPCs that really don't even reflect the house that people have been to, if they've been there at all. Uh, the next step is a strategy. So, defining the scope of the works. As I say, this needs to take place really prior to you making a bid, because you need to understand what's involved before you actually make that uh, apply for the bid or make the bid. Step five is the design. Step six, installation and handover. And step seven, monitoring and evaluation. Monitoring and evaluation should be carried out throughout the process of the project. Once the project starts, there should be an amount of monitoring and evaluation from start to finish. So going back to what I said about um, retrofit advisors being used for other things other than just talking to people on the phone, it's a good idea if the retrofit coordinator can't do it, is to ask the advisor to go to the site once a week and just have a look around, take a few photographs of what the what's happening on site and feed back to the coordinator. That way, the coordinator's not left in the dark or doesn't turn up three weeks after the project started and start saying, no, this isn't working, that's not right, that's not correct, because otherwise then the project either comes to a stop or a load more work has to be done, which obviously costs money. So I was trying to um, say earlier how the risk path um, is defined or decided. So this, uh, there are two pages here, and this is just a screenshot of a risk, uh, risk assessment. So down here on the left hand side here, you'll see uh, the measures that have been selected. OK, and across here, this has got all the measures that you could or could not recommend. The yellow and the green. If you put the two measures to get put two measures together and they meet on the path of yellow or green, they're absolutely fine to install. If on the other hand they come to orange, then you may have to do some modeling or designing or design one of those options out. And if it comes to red, then clearly it's not going to work to put both measures in. OK. So you start at the top with your risk assessment. It would be the number of dwellings, either 1 to 10, 11 to 30, or 30 plus. Down here, you will see construction of built form of the buildings that you're going to be working on. So they could be just conventional projects, not high rise and not protected. Traditional build, not protected, that's solid brick up to 19, uh, 1920. System built, which is can be timber frame, solid concrete, etc. High rise, any construction in high rise, and then uh, protected, any construction or built form that is protected. So it could be come on in conservation area or it could be a listed building. That those two things, plus the amount of um, improvements you decide to do, will define the risk path. 
and this is the bottom of the, of the screen. Down here, you'll see that this, the overall risk path for this particular project is C. So then we push, uh, we push the next use this path but risk path button, and that moves us on to our ventilation strategy, etc. Improvement option evaluation. We use this. What we do here with the improvement option evaluation, we list all the improvements that might be applicable to this, these properties. OK, so for medium high risk projects, it requires the retrofit coordinators to carry out an improvement option evaluation and review it with the client. So you sit down with your client and you go through all the improvement options that are available for their property or that might be uh, uh, done on the property. And then you decide with the client. What the outcome of the of the project they would like to see and how best to go forward and which uh, improvements to recommend. Once the evaluation, uh, it should form part of the basis of the medium term uh, improvement plan, which we're going to uh, show you in a minute. The whole house improvement plan also developed by the retrofit coordinator, which establishes the extent of the improvement necessary to reduce emissions in a way that is consistent with national commitments and provides resilience against the effects of climate change. So it determines the order in which the improvement measures should be impl implemented for cost effectiveness and to avoid blocking future improvements. So what we try to do, once we've got our improvement option evaluation ready, <clears throat> we try to put our medium term improvement plan together with the client. So we, de we decide what the client needs first. So we look at fabric first. Fabric first is very important because if we don't close up the home or, the, or put a secure envelope around the home, then we can't think about using renewables. So our medium term improvement plan should start off with insulation moving forward through the house. It should be produced to guide the process of retrofitting the house in stages over 20 or 30 years. This gives good time for the client to be able to manage the payments. And also what it does do over those 20 to 30 years, it reduces the heat demand of the home. The idea of the medium term improvement plan and fabric first is to reduce the heat demand of any home. So that means firstly, making uh, the building insulated. So the insulation is continuous around the home, eliminating all thermal bridges, um, making sure the house is in good order, eliminating your thermal bridges, uh, and then we can move on to maybe assessing the heat, uh, the heat provider. So are we looking at a new boiler? Are we looking at heat pumps? Is it time to put heat pumps in? It also identifies combination of measures. So if we're going to do a medium term improvement plan, we don't only have to do one measure at a time. Sorry, uh, Michael. Yeah, I just I just had a quick query. So on the if if we're looking at um, insulation first and fabric first, um, you know, internal insulation is something that is relatively straightforward, particularly where we've got a uh, infill uh, the rest of the the properties. Um, so you know, if we've got say two flats that are EPCD, um, and we want to bring them up to the standard with the SHDF funding, but then we've got say fifty other flats in that block. Um, so the internal insulation kind of is is a cost effective solution for that for those two flats but using external uh insulation or cavity wall insulation then bumps the price up and then we're we've got like 48 infill properties and and the only two well the rest of the flats will benefit but the only two that are actually going to be eligible for the funding 
are, are, are the same too. So what would you do in that sort of situation in terms of a, say, fabric first approach? OK, in that situation, you're quite right. Internal insulation would be the, the, the preferred option. What I would say is that if you're doing, obviously, if you're doing the internal wall insulation, which would work, depending on the size, obviously, of, of the property, because that the internal wall insulation will reduce, obviously, their footprint uh, uh, by an amount. Um, also, you have to make sure that you eliminate any thermal bridges and any, and you make sure you don't affect the other properties by doing the work. Because clearly, if you're insulating the walls, it's great, but then you would have to make sure that uh, you eliminate the thermal bridge on the property you're working with, but also make sure you don't create any any adverse thermal bridges on on the properties around them. This is where the designer comes in, and this is where the designer um, gets, you know, is 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 it very important. And in a project like that, obviously, if you're talking about a block of flats, it's likely to be risk path B minimum, I would think, probably risk path C. Um, so the designer and retrofit coordinator would get together and, and talk about it, but mainly that's the designer's work. But yes. It would be the best option, but as I say, you you need to make sure that you do mitigate thermal bridges. You do have to um, let everybody around you, uh, all the other tenants or or occupiers, know that you're doing the work. Um, yeah. It's not. Sorry. No, I was going to say that's brilliant. Thank you. I just wanted to to sort of clarify that, but that's that's really useful. Yeah, it, 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 it is a bit of a worry. And the other thing is, of course, if you've got, it depends what your party wall is like between the two occupiers. If you've got um, a cavity party wall, then you could possibly, uh, because obviously if you've got a cavity party, party wall, it, there's a draft going up and down constantly unless it's been filled, um, which it's unlikely in a block that you're talking about. So if you were to insulate, insulate the party wall on the on the side of the the um, resident in that case you'd probably be fine however if it was a solid party wall you'd have to be very careful that you weren't uh, creating a cold wall on the other side or on the on the neighbor side so yeah. yeah you have to be very very careful great yeah thank you okay you're welcome um i will um take questions as we go if you like i wasn't quite sure how it was going to work but so if i see a hand up uh, I'll, uh, I'll gladly answer the question. So your medium term improvement plan preserves opportunities for the future as well. It is lodged with Trustmark. So if you, um, supposing you as, as um, a housing provider were to do some improvements on those homes and then the, the client decided to buy the home, and then they wanted work done later on that you weren't going to do, the person who was going to carry out that work could get the documents from Trustmark and see what's been done, to what level it's been done, what the U values were, et cetera. And also they could the, they would use the medium term improvement plan and the um, option evaluation to, to use, they might use the same U values, they might use the same materials. That way you've got a coordinated project, continuous coordinated project. Are you um, a coordinator, Michael, or architect? Um, <laughs> no, I'm uh, I'm the head of asset management uh, for RBKC, uh, but a surveyor. My background's QSing, so um, so you know, I suppose what we're looking for is is uh, like solutions that 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 are cost effective, because obviously we're you know we do have financial limitations uh, we, you know it's not it's not us per se that are paying for this it's residents and leaseholders and we just want to make sure that we're not not sort of uh i suppose you know going over the top um to improve so that example was a good example with two two properties but a block of 50 that actually need improvement and looking at sort of cost effective ways of improving it so that was where where my question came from 
Yeah, I suppose with past 2035 and this medium term improvement plan or the just past 2035, what it does, if it's if the process is followed correctly, then it allows you to add to the other add the other properties as you go or even add to the property that you're in. The, the problem that's arisen in quite a lot of projects, as you will probably understand, is that pe people have been given money or bid for money from phase, etc. And then what happens, they just think, oh, that's a good idea. We'll just do that. They don't consider the consequences of, say, putting external wall insulation on or just putting solar panels on the roof. You know, I mean, the amount of money that's been wasted putting solar panels on people's roofs is just beyond belief. You know, I just I don't understand why you would spend five thousand pounds doing that when you could probably get them a new boiler, insulate yeah. the home. <laughs> well, we were we were we were thinking about um, solar panels, but then there's the issues with roof warranties as well, uh, and and you know the, the the roof warranty just they won't stand, will will they? And then if there's damage, it's who caused it. We you know we the the roof the roofing contractors obviously going to say the person who installed the solar panel and vice versa and then we're the asset holder aren't we so we we really just need um you know we'd like to do solar panels but I think it's uh it's probably more of a nice to have yeah if, if I'm honest I think they're good if you want to get the EPC rating right <laughs> they're they're a good ploy I think if for the for the client or or your tenants they're great. They think, oh, that's great, you know. But I mean, the average saving with with um, solar panels without batteries is about two hundred fifty pound a year. You know, it's 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 not fantastic. I I, I appreciate two hundred fifty pound a year is a lot of money to some people. However, if you say, as you say, you're going to put internal wall insulation on the these two flats, they'll probably get a much better benefit from that money than than overall. Where the payback will probably be much better as well. But obviously, if the client was paying for it, you're paying for it, so you're not going to get the payback. But what I'm saying is those properties probably benefit more from the internal wall insulation than the solar panels. Yeah, yeah. No, thanks very much. That's re really, really useful. Uh, I see a hand up. I don't know who it is. Uh, Phil Francis. Um, earlier on, you mentioned about getting your team in place and, and signing the project off. Um, yeah. I take it if if the project's not signed off, is the funding lost, and who makes up the difference to finish the project? Well, that's the problem uh, in Nottingham. I know that, as I say, just for instance, that the, the uh, loft insulation wasn't paid wasn't paid for by base because it wasn't uh, installed by a past 2030 installer. So Nottingham City Council had to pay for it. Someone had to pay the contractor. Right. It's the same as anything else that you do. It's if you get to the end of the project, and and I know Bayes were very strict um, with Nottingham. They said that is the the cut off date. We want it signed off, or you don't get your funding. Well, they committed to about thirty or forty houses, I think, with external wall insulation, loft insulation, and you know if you can imagine how much that's cost. You know, with scaffolding contractors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yeah, and yeah, you obviously you'd have to foot the bill, or mm -hmm. whoever the organised project would have to foot the bill. So that's why I say it's very, very important for you to get at least a plan in place, so that if you get the, the funding, you can kick you can kick straight off rather than than um, thinking, oh right, I need the team. Uh, you know, and um, right, and now I need to source product. Product. I need to source installers. If you've all got them waiting, I know it's not easy, but if you've mm. got as much done as possible before you actually, you know, get the nod for the bid, then it then it's much easier to kick off, and you're more likely to get the project finished. Right. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword then, in in terms of you, you'll spend some money out getting this team together and putting a lot of. Um, props in place and you might not get the funding yeah right but, okay but better to Be spend that money than, than you know i mean i think when you put these bids together you, it's it's um it's it's all a bit of a you know you it's all a bit of a juggling act isn't it you know and i suppose if you just just get your your teams aligned and ready to go 
I know you're going to have to spend some money, but it's better than getting to the end of the co the um, project and having to sign stuff off that you're not confident it's good. And then or l lose the funding. It is very difficult, yeah. Yeah, cheers. Um, thank you. I see another hand there. Hannah, are you on it? I can't see who they are. I just see hands up. <laughs> yeah. Faye Faye, did you have a question? Oh, hi, Faye Faye. You're on mute, Faye Faye. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah. It's Faye Faye here. I'm the Energy and Sustainability Project Manager in Housing. Just want to quickly add on what Mike's question there. So we do have a lot of properties that is high rise. So therefore, most of our internal flats that's already an EPCC properties. And uh, this resulted being when we put in the bid, we have EPCD properties dotted around around our blocks. So five property per block. Does that mean that uh, we only need to survey those five properties uh, per block? And uh, we only need to look after these five properties that's in the bid to be past compliance? Yes, it's just the properties that, that you are working on that pass the compliance. What, as a, but as I said to Michael, you need to be very careful with your design to make sure that you don't affect the other properties in an adverse way. So the you know as like I said it's it can it it it's not I don't think it's that difficult but it needs to be done properly and and you know so other, otherwise the the compliance only applies to the properties you're working on yes if that was your question okay okay thank you what I would do in your case Feifei if you're going to have have you already ascertained that they will reach the EPC rating that you want. Uh, it it depends on the projects because we had a, a project in wave one where we put a third of the property and when they surveyed they were saying some of the property already see and then they went for the, all the properties within that block with the hope of identifying other properties that might be a D. So I was really wondering rather than the property specific or the whole block approach because it will be completely different scopes for us yeah and how big is the block we've got 60s properties per block mm. 50s yeah. per, per block is we're mainly high rise and multi-story yeah yeah, they're big high rise, big projects, aren't they? You know, if, if, as Michael said, if you're picking out the individual properties, it's not so difficult. If you're going for the whole block, I think it's sometimes it makes it more difficult because, uh, you know, and more costly, of course, much more costly. Yeah, that, that's the challenges we are facing now. Yes, it is. Yeah, everybody's, you know. Uh, we're all and especially cost, when it's we? related to ventilation, do we only need to satisfy Hit the box within those properties, or we need to ventilate the whole block. So that that's where I'm coming from. Right. Okay. So um, there were some properties, <clears throat> I believe it was the Peabody buildings in London, that were full of damp and and mold and uh, um, condensation, etc. So what they did, they put uh, a centralised uh, ventilation strategy in place. However, that's not always needed. Sometimes if you've got appropriate uh, windows in, in the property uh, and you can maybe um, educate the, the people in the property themselves, providing you um, make sure that your thermal bridging is all eliminated, it can be possible not to have to ventilate mechanically. As long as they've got um, decentralised ventilation in uh, all the wet rooms, so bathroom, kitchen, etc. You know, you need ventilation in those in those rooms. <clears throat> but a lot of it is down to education um, of the tenants. If, if 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 yeah, it is really helpful, Ken, and it's it's really sort of useful to speak to somebody who's obviously a you know an expert in this field. Um, 
I was going to, going to ask as well, so we just because we've moved on to ventilation, um, I did notice that there were some of the PAS 35 stuff in terms of ventilation talks about all internal doors having a clearance underneath of 10 millimetres to give 760 millimetres squared. And then you've got the fire doors sometimes, internal fire doors in properties, and they're meant to be three mils and or fitted as per the manufacturer's instructions. So where, you know, I mean, we we obviously need to adhere to the NHBC standards as well as and and make sure we've got fire safe properties. And you know, where, where, how does that kind of how do we be past compliant if 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 we if we're looking at something and thinking actually there's other standards that PAS doesn't necessarily adhere to? Okay, I'm not quite sure how you would be fixed there. My feeling is that <clears throat> PAS 2035 would err on the side of safety and allow the three mil for the doors. I think what it is, the big problem with, with a lot of places is you, you get the, your door undercut, then someone has a new carpet down, so every room suddenly has got no, there's no through ventilation. That's the big problem. If there's no through ventilation, that's part of what I'm saying to Feifei Fei, that sometimes it's just education that people need or you know some small alterations to help ventilate the property adequately most properties it's only really properties near railway lines and that where you can't have windows open that that need the centralized stuff in my opinion otherwise it's normally just the wet rooms that need that need ventilating the 10 mil undercut i think you probably get away with the three mil for on the fire doors that's for sure you couldn't possibly cut I mean, what's the point of having a fire door and having a 10, 10 mil undercut? You know, it, that wouldn't be right. I think you have to, um, there has to be some kind of balance, if you know what I mean. Um, yeah. If, yeah, if yeah. it was me, if I was coming there, if I was a uh, cold and I would definitely sign it off at, and leaving the fire doors as they are. Likewise. Okay. So it would be on the design coordinator in conjunction with the principal designer or something to. Yeah. To, yeah. to to balance oh. that up and make a decision because it's a uh, you know I suppose from our perspective we just want to make sure that we're not leaving I think you know thinking about the big picture and other risks as well as improving sustainability so just then um, could could see the potential conflict there so yeah I think I, th I think if you're going to get the designer and coordinator one of the other would have to get in touch with a with a fire safety expert and um and maybe get it clarified by past 2035 but to be honest with you if the installers and even the fire door installers will probably be past 2030 qualified um uh, certified anyway so you know they'll they'll know what they're doing they'll know that um they'll be able to advise you better on that yep yeah. all right thanks ken that's useful cheers no problem you okay hannah are we yeah, okay? I think, yeah, yeah. If you've got a couple more slides. I was just going to move on to monitoring, monitoring and evaluation. Yeah, very, very you. important. As I mentioned at the beginning of this uh, little session, monitoring throughout the project is most important, but follow up is, is equally important. <clears throat> so your basic monitoring after a couple of months, get back in touch with the client, give them a feedback form saying what they need just maybe visit the project if you've got time to go and visit and just see what's happening um, make sure that there's no uh, unintended consequences like um, poor air quality or condensation forming etc then maybe advise as to why the condensation's forming maybe if you put all new windows in they've got the windows all shut they're not give, ad, allowing any ventilation at all and relying on the mechanical, then you can advise that maybe just to open the windows. Most of the new windows nowadays have got a little bit where you can open it and just leave it slightly ajar. So it gives ventilation, but no draft. Um, intermediate, that comes back if you have had problems uh, and then they've been rectified. The intermediate um, evaluation is to make sure that those new additions or the uh, work that's been rectified is up to standard and is now performing properly. And then you've got your advanced monitoring. If there's a real serious problem uh, and it can't be or it needs um, to be put right or it's a serious problem that's caused the householder um, issues and they want to take it further, then you have to get an independent retrofit coordinator or evaluator when they um, finally get a course going for the evaluation uh, to come in and have a look at it 
um, as an as uh, an independent. OK. That is me. Great, and <laughs> thanks any, a lot for that, Ken. Any questions? It was a bit rushed. I probably could have done with an hour. I could have put a few more slides in, but is there any <laughs> questions? Does anybody want to know anything about past 2035 that I can maybe help with or they're confused with? My word, this is easy this afternoon. <laughs> oh, Doug, is it? It is. Hi. So I think you're right. It was a little bit rushed. Uh, yeah, there is more to this uh, that we probably need to um, need to know. So um, uh, we may well be in touch a little bit more if that's OK. And we could probably do a bit more work together if that's an opportunity for us. Doug, I'd be more um, than happy to put a better, better, another presentation together. What I said I was going to do this afternoon was just go through and make it easy to, to comply with past 2035 going forward. But if more information about twist past 2035, I can definitely do. So so from my point of view, uh, I'm meeting with Des NZ uh, on Thursday to and they want some reassurance from us that we are geared up on wave two. Hannah, I know you're meeting tomorrow with staff uh, uh, on this. Um, and uh, having so I'm the director of housing management. So so having listened in, uh, it does feel to me that this is, uh, um, you know, it's going to be something we're going to have to organise uh, really effectively. And just so you know, everyone else in the call, uh, uh, Desnes are offering us help and support as well. So what we what I feel like is there's so many things to so many bits that you've got to do right or you can lose all the funding and we've already had that happen to us in in round one haven't we where we've done the work ultimately it's made a difference but because we haven't followed it we've lost funding so um uh they're very clear that they don't want to see us do that again so they're here to help well that's what we hear so so we'll find out i'm meeting them on thursday uh, uh and uh team's meeting tomorrow but uh, i think we're going to need a lot more than just this Well, if you're happy to have me back, I'm happy to provide more. Uh, and you, a, and a, but we would need an hour or more. Yeah. A good hour. Um, I'm sure if you're up for it, Ken, we can definitely <laughs> arrange that. <laughs> Thomas, Thomas, you got a question? Yeah, do you want to talk to you yeah, Tom? Yeah. Uh, hi, Ken. Oh, um, hi. Yeah, I was just... <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I got your question. Too, I <laughs> um, yeah, I was just wondering, what do you think from your experience is the best practice in sort of ensuring collaboration between the teams and ensuring that any sort of risks and issues are sort of raised correctly? Well, I think obviously uh, your monthly meetings off site are good, but you need to have site meetings on a regular basis. That, that's definitely, um, like I said earlier, if you've got coordinator or a couple of coordinators that are covering lots of um, projects, it's a good time to use your retrofit advisors if you've employed any or people of that ilk who understand, but with guidance from the coordinator, as long as they know what information they're gathering on site, then it's a good idea to send them out. Obviously, you're, you signing the project off is still your responsibility, but for them to go out, take all the photographs, make some notes, speak to people on site, ask the questions that you've asked them to, to relay, and then get them back in the office or give them, get them to send you a report fully documented with photographs. I'm a big fan of photographs while projects are going forward because without those, you've got no real evidence. It's all he said, she said. If you've got photographs, you can say there's a dated photograph there. This is what was done on the day. This is how I know the project's going to, to plan. Or go back to the, to the contractor and say, look, this is not right. This is not what we paid for. There's a question on the air chat. Yeah, um, so we've got a question from Mo as well. Mo, did you want to come on mic? And... Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Hi, Ken. Um, I'm just wondering in terms of just plan eight wins, what's your view on having the retrofit rows that you described at the beginning of your presentation in-house or um, maybe lying with the main contractor? Or is there like an hybrid halfway house whereby there's certain rows that must be kept in-house and there's certain rows that must stay with the um, main contractor? Uh, well, only the installer. Oh, if you 
I see. Well, I'm a I'm a great believer that the coordinator should should maybe work for you rather than the contractor, because if the coordinator is working for the contractor, there's a conflict of interest. OK, so I think the coordinator should work for you. He yeah. should be overseeing the contractor. The assessor. Well, it doesn't that doesn't really matter because, as I say, the assessor's got to do a good job. You know, he's got to make sure that a good job. The coordinator should know what information the assessor should be getting or gathering. So the coordinator will gradually find out whether he's got good assessors on board or not. But the coordinator role, I think, should stay with you and not the contractor. If they say they've got their own coordinator, say we'd rather have our own coordinator, please. Because it it honestly, it's just a nightmare. If, if, because if they get, if they decide to change something and don't want to inform you or it's going to be cheaper for them and they start installing cheaper products and the coordinator signs it off, you've got a bad job and you're going to have one hell of a job to go back to them and say, you know, you did this job all wrong and they'll say, well, the coordinator signed it off. They'll probably sack him and you still won't get your, your money because you'll have to take in the court. So it's, it's I would keep it in-house. Thank you. What about for the evaluator, Rob? Uh, well, the coordinator can be the evaluator. Right, okay. There is no evaluator role at the moment. Uh, it is in past 2035, but as to my knowledge, they've not trained anybody and there isn't a course for it. But the coordinator, it does the same job as a coordinator. If you get to the point where you're advanced monitoring and you've had some real serious issues, then that's the time you have to call in an independent coordinator not from the contractor, not from yourself, but from an outside source. There's another hand up, is there? Yes, we've got a question from Shirley as well. Hi, Ken. Oh, hello. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I snuck in. Well, I saw um, that name up there. I thought it can't be. It is indeed me. Um, my query actually is one that's come to light today, actually. We've uh, been out on site and we've taken photos of the job, as you described, and we're having a problem with the geotagging. And we're wondering how fussy are they likely to be that if they're taking pictures, we all know it's notoriously difficult. It tells you you're in Tesco's and you're in the petrol station down the road. Um, and, and they're having a problem where, for example, they'll be in number 12, and the geotagging shows them as being in number eight. How fussy are the coordinators really going to be? And Trustmark as well. And the obviously we, we're dealing with PAS 2030. So we've got the accreditation bodies for the installers. So it's all those people we have to keep happy and just wondering how like, fussy they're going okay. to be. Best thing I can say, Shirley, if, if you're taking photographs of a particular property, yeah, because you know fine well you can get the time of the prop, the photographs taken, yeah, um, and yeah. all that sort of thing. I would say as you're going into the property, take a picture of the front door, the number on the front door, and use that. That's the only way. Uh, geotagging, I know, is difficult, um, but I think as a coordinator myself, I would accept photographs, providing you've got a picture of the front door, and the time is right. I mean, if you've got a picture of the front door and another picture's taken half an hour later and it looks a little bit, I'm going to I'm going to maybe ask a question. But if they're all in sequence, the photographs, then, you know, I don't really see a problem with that. Right. OK, that's great. Thanks, Ken. Anybody else, Hannah? Uh, we haven't got any hands up at the moment. Have we got any okay. other questions from anyone? Give a second if anyone's thinking. I think if we do another session on past 2035 itself, we probably will have a lot more questions. <laughs> yeah, I think so. We've definitely got into a lot of detail today, and I'm sure if we have any more conversations, we can just keep yeah, going it, and going. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do have a question actually. Oh, so we've uh, got a question from Hazel. Can yeah. you hear her? Yeah, I just wanted to yeah. know, like, of, of, in your experience, what has been the most common um, past 2035 compliance challenge you've had so far? I mean, from 
where I am right now, I've actually been seeing um, problems with, uh, for example, doing our retrofit assessments because of access issues. But um, of course, it would be good to understand what um, other challenges are so that we can prepare for it as well. OK, I think the biggest challenges are the contractors. Like I said, the problem is you employ a contractor. But then you have to ensure that the people they're employing. Are past 2030 compliant? Because as I say, that that's what went wrong in Nottingham. Everybody thought it was going straight until I pointed out that I couldn't get the past 2030 compliance for the firm that actually installed the the um, uh, loft insulation. And that way, you know, that suddenly they said, "Oh, we didn't realise that they got the they got the roofer, but the roofer had got somebody else in." So you have to. That's where your challenge might be, um, Hazel, is to make sure that. If they're presenting you with their method statement and they are including subcontractors in the method statement, you have to ensure that those sub or they have to ensure that those subcontractors are all past 2030 compliant. Okay. Do you know if off the back of that have Nottingham now included that in their like procurement? So if they're going out to tender but having that as a requirement, do you know? Uh, I th yes, that will be for going forward. That will definitely be a, be a requirement. You can't yeah. because otherwise, you you if you went to to a, to an electrician say and and they were installing all your solar panels and he gave it to somebody else, he subcontracted it out, and they weren't past twenty thirty compliant. Who's going to pay for all that work? Yeah, yeah. Because I think because we've because we've had a few kind of rounds of SHDF. Uh, funding so we've been working with some contractors to support them to get past 2030 registered and also Trustmark as well um, because I guess in some cases it is difficult finding the right contractors but then particularly as we're kind of scaling up um, to wave two it's going to be increasingly important to make sure we've got the right people kind of working with us in the first place. Oh, I think you're absolutely right. If you've got people that aren't compliant, but you think can be and they would do a better job for you, then clearly if you're going to if you can assist them to get, you know, to get their certificate, then that's great. You know, that would be the way I'd go. It's like it's yeah. like I said at the beginning, it's having people you can rely on and that do do a good job, you know, because nothing worse than getting another contractor in that you're not really sure about. And then they make a complete ash of it and, and you've got to start again or it's just a complete mess and also um you have to be aware of financial uh, constraints as well some some of these firms or they might look big but then you take them on and then suddenly they haven't got the, the money to go and get the you know get the right equipment or the right um stuff to that they're supposed to be installing so what do they do they get a cheaper and they get on site and pray that the retrofit coordinator doesn't come around and ask ask for their you know the certificates yeah yeah <laughs> it's all it's all it's all a game trust me don't you? Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a nightmare really but you know to not be able to trust people is terrible but you have to be so so careful especially with this and and you're signing off and i mean most retrofit coordinators unless they're employed obviously will have to have public liability as well so um you know there's yeah. that to it so that's always worth checking as well yeah. If you like, if you're employing individuals or getting individuals to come in and work for you, just make sure that they've got their public liability insurance as well. Mm -hmm. True, true. Great. Um, I think if we've got one more question from Faith, and then I suppose we'll have to finish up there. Yes, just very quick one from me, please. Can based yes, on your that. experience for past risk past C projects, how long do you think realistically we need? to from the time we appoint the retrofit coordinator to the project accomplish. How long do you think that is on average based on your experience? Well, having not run many past C projects, um, are you asking from start to finish of the project or from the start or until they produce their certificates and and documents well from your point the retrofit coordinator till yes or the certificate okay well i mean 
if I was giving you prices and I was looking, I mean, you really only need a couple of weeks to work all that out. But I wouldn't no, be. See. Sorry. Sorry, I meant, I meant from the, you appoint the retrofit coordinator to the project and yeah. then deliver the whole project. Do you do a survey, design, delivery till oh. the end? Well, I can't speak for the designer, I'm afraid. I, I, I wouldn't know how long that would take. But I would imagine a good architect. It's, I don't know. I, I wouldn't like to answer that one. It depends on the size of the project. Yeah, exactly. And some of your projects are quite big. I mean, if you're looking at tower blocks with 60 units, you know, that's going to take some some work. You know, it's all got to be drawn. Um, architects have to go to site, measure it all. Um, I know that they use um, design simulation modeling nowadays. Um, uh, stuff like design builder and that sort of thing to do it, but it still takes time and it's, you know, it's a fairly big project. So I don't think I'd like to commit on that one, Fei Fei. I think you might have to ask, ask the designer. <laughs> okay, fair enough. All right, well, <laughs> um, we're at time. So thanks a lot for that, Ken, really appreciate it. Um, I think personally, by far the most kind of practical mm -hmm. explanation of how the past 2035, and I think, very clear that a lot of it is about kind of getting the right people to work with you and about that communication relationship um which i think is a lot more of a useful kind of take on it than some of the more like process focused ones um and yeah i think managed to get into a lot of detail with the questions as well so yeah just thanks again and thank you everybody for joining and i think probably seems like it would be helpful to have a few follow-up chats off the back of this mm -hmm. so uh yeah hazel and i can uh get in touch to arrange that that's good yeah sure and if Thanks. you as I say if you'd like a more in-depth um talk on past past 2035 then uh, i can put that together no problem yeah brilliant that'd be good as, as we found out today 30 minutes isn't a lot of time <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah can do a whole lot more but yeah that would be great um cool and we'll we'll send out slides and the recording to everyone that was invited and then yeah if anybody does have any follow-up questions for ken then feel free to send them on to mm -hmm. uh, hazel and myself and we can pass them on and thanks a lot for hazel for organizing great work <laughs> thanks ken and thanks everyone for coming okay thanks everyone uh, thanks everyone Take care.